morning. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 5 this morning. If you want to get your Bibles out and follow along with me, or if you still have your phones out from the Fall Connection code. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he begged to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Thank you, Alyssa, for reading that text for us. In a few moments, we'll, we'll explore together what that means. But to those of us here in the room, those watching from our South Street campus, our Mill Creek campus, and our North Aurora campus, I have the very exciting privilege to introduce to you our guest preacher this morning. I've been looking forward to this weekend for a long time. Um, and if I was to ask you, is, is it difficult in the world today to find public Christians who are angry, defensive, fearful, and dug in against the world? No, it's not. There's lots of examples, right? Is it difficult to find Christians in the public sphere today who are uh, compromising their beliefs and caving in to the winds of our culture, our secular culture? No, it's not. There's lots of examples of those. What is difficult to find, in my opinion, are Christians in the public sphere who are deeply committed to the word of God as their authority and yet joyful, engaging, compelling, and winsomely uh, communicating the hope of the gospel to a world that desperately needs it. John Dixon is such a Christian. Long before I met him in person, I was uh, influenced, blessed, and, and challenged and grew through his writing and his podcast and his public ministry. He came and spoke to our staff months ago, and God led him and his wife, Buff, and their daughter to move to Wheaton. He's the distinguished chair of public Christianity. That he holds the John the Gene Kwame uh, Public uh, Chair of uh, Distinguished Christianity uh, at Wheaton College. He's held positions in... Uh, colleges in Melbourne and in Sydney and in Oxford. He's written more than 20 books. He's the host of the podcast Undeceptions, which I've mentioned many times, and the book which I've given to probably half of you uh, called Bullies and Saints. Um, we're thrilled to have him here with us. It's a great blessing. This will be the first of several times he gets to come and preach the word of God to the Chapel Street Church family. So join me in welcoming Dr. John Dixon. Thanks, <laughs> Uh, Jeff has bent over backwards to, to make me feel welcome, including entirely exaggerated introductions like that. Uh, he, he's taken me out to lunch as soon as I arrived. He uh, somehow arranged a car for us for the first couple of weeks that we uh, landed in your country. And uh, just this morning, he's lending me a winter coat. Uh, actually, I, I think he pinched it from his son, Ben. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, because all of our stuff is still in a crate in port at New York. Though we sent it four months ago from Sydney. So I don't know what's going on. But most importantly and most difficultly, Jeff, I guess to make me feel quite welcome, has perfected the Australian greeting. G'day, mate. I have never heard an American say it properly. If you want to hear it the way Steve Irwin did it, the way Bluey does it, go to Jeff and hear an American say, G'day, mate. That has nothing to do with what I want to talk to you about. 
Uh, just last week, I landed back from Israel, where I led 50 Americans and Aussies around the country in a history tour that I take each year. And part of the tour was to take everyone to this spot here. Right now, it is the third holiest site in Islam. The Haram al-Sharif is where the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Golden Dome are. From the 700s, it's been sacred to Islam. But this is also the very site of the Jerusalem Jewish Temple of Jesus' day. In fact, this where we're all standing uh, was the area known as the Court of the Gentiles where all the Gentiles, that is the nations, were meant to stream to Jerusalem to this part of the temple so that they could hear about the justice and mercy of the one true God. And this is also the very spot where Jesus overturned the tables. You remember that account in the Gospels? Outraged at the injustice of the priests who were selling at a profit, the priestly sacrifices, who were changing your money and making a profit on the side. And Jesus bursts into this area, overturns the tables, outraged at injustice. And yet, this spot is also the site of one of the most atrocious acts of Christian injustice in the history of Christianity. This is the site when in July 15th, 1099, 10,000 European Christian crusaders burst into Jerusalem, went up to the Temple Mount, and slaughtered not just combatants, but women and children huddled up there. I have read the letters of the Crusaders. I've read the accounts of the church service they held after they had slain everyone. Why do I tell you that? Because I want to talk today about the way of justice, the way of righteousness. In the Bible, those two words are interchangeable, by the way, justice, righteousness. But I want to admit right up front that Christians haven't always followed this way. This, for me, is a powerful reminder that sometimes Christians have done the opposite of what Jesus did, that is, lift up the broken. They have crushed and committed terrible evils. And here's the interesting thing. This is exactly where Jesus begins this famous Sermon on the Mount we just heard read to us. He begins with the attitude that he calls on us to have. That is an attitude that acknowledges our failings before we even begin to think about the failings of everyone else. His opening word, notice, of this sublime ethical discourse, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's such an amazing opener for what would go on to be the purest ethical discourse in history. He opens by saying, hey, you gotta know that you're poor before you hear all the riches. And Matthew uh, does everything he can to build up to these opening words of the Messiah. First, he tells us how many people are there. For one thing, he says large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, the region across the Jordan followed him. Huge crowd. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up and began to teach them. So we have a massive crowd. And then Matthew adds the grammatical equivalent of a drum roll. Um, there are seven verbs in this sentence introducing Jesus' opening lines. Seven verbs. Now, those of you who are English teachers or remember anything about your English classes, you never put seven verbs in a sentence. But look, this is literally what uh, Matthew says. Seeing the crowds, he went up a mountain, and sitting down, his disciples came to him, and so opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, what's the point of this? It's to slow things down 
So you're ready to hear the opening words of the Messiah. And what are those opening words? Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's all about admitting spiritual bankruptcy. I love how Don Carson puts this, the Canadian-American theologian. He says, poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. It's a conscious confession of unworth before God. As such, it is the deepest form of repentance. Now, you may be sitting there going, I, I don't feel so bankrupt spiritually. So let's do a little test, right? Um, I'm going to read a line from the Sermon on the Mount, right? The next two chapters of Matthew. And you're going to give yourself a private score out of 10. No calling out, okay? Just private score out of 10 for how you did this week. Let's just go with this week. Ready? Here we go. Anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone doing well? Okay. Anyone who looks at someone lustfully has already committed adultery in the heart. Okay. Love your enemies. Or this one. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people to be seen by them. Oh, bummer. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Huh. And if you still think you're doing okay, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Friends, if these are the ethical riches, who of us is not poor? Bankrupt. We enter God's kingdom into the way of righteousness, not by thinking we can do it and have done it, but by acknowledging we haven't and we can't and we don't deserve the kingdom. And only at that point is the kingdom of heaven ours, Jesus says. Because the beautiful truth of the gospel is Jesus lived this life on our behalf and then gave that life on a cross for us. Which doesn't mean that we are not called to follow this way of justice. Of course we are. But it begins by knowing that we haven't and can't and have no credit with God. And once you understand that first line, the beatitude, they call it, the statement of blessing, the second one flows really logically and it too is about our attitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. See, if we admit the poverty of our own soul, we'll look out at the wrongdoing of the world, not in a judgmental spirit, but with grief. Grief. Jesus is almost certainly thinking of Isaiah 61 for this idea of comfort for those who mourn. Here's what uh, Isaiah 61 says. The Lord has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. There it is. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. So you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. What should be our attitude when we witness the robbery and wrongdoing and injustice of the world? Not smugness, not self-righteousness, which the church is sometimes famous for. Is that just Australian church or does that ever happen here? No, that's not our attitude. Our attitude should be grief, mourning, because we know the bankruptcy of our own soul. If I can put it like this, our attitude toward the world should be a humble melancholy that first recognizes the wrong in here and only then looks at the world and grieves. Such a person will be comforted, Jesus says, comforted. 
How so? Well, partly because such a person will get to see the overthrow of injustice in the kingdom of God. And partly because such a person can enact that future kingdom in the here and now by living out this way of justice. And that's what the remaining six Beatitudes are about. They are about action on behalf of the kingdom of God. And the first action, if you can think of it as an action, is this. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Everyone in Jesus' audience knew that he was referring to a specific Old Testament passage in this line. It's straight out of Psalm 37. Everyone knew this. Psalm 37 goes, Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. A little while and the wicked will be no more, but the meek will inherit the land. So meek doesn't mean being mild-mannered, right? Which is pretty good news for some of you, right? Because you're not mild-mannered and you look at that and you go, oh, no. No, what it means is refraining from wrath in the face of evil and unjust power. And Jesus' first hearers, for sure, were thinking of the Romans who had occupied Israel from 63 B.C., General Pompey, the great arch enemy of Julius Caesar, came into Jerusalem in 63 BC with his vast armies and said, I'll have this. And from 63 BC, right up to when Jesus preached this in Galilee, the Romans had unjustly conquered the people of God. And many in Jesus' audience must have been thinking, they are the ones with wicked schemes. And they were filled with wrath and anger toward the Romans. In fact, we know how they felt because here's a song we know that faithful Jews in the period immediately after the Romans, immediately before Jesus, sang. This was written by Pharisees in Jerusalem, by the way. It's not from the Bible. It's one of the intertestamental texts. The kingdom of our God is forever over the nations in judgment. See, O Lord, and raise up for your people their king, the son of David, as in the Messiah. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, to smash the arrogance of sinners like a potter's jar, and their king shall be the Lord Messiah. That's how people felt about the Romans. Now you, as soon as you know that, think of Jesus and his vision of the kingdom of God and of the Messiah. He's not about smashing the sinners, but acknowledging we are all sinners. Mourning the injustice of the world, but also committing to the way of meekness. Not the path of anger and wrath. This helps us understand the Beatitudes that follow, including verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, the word righteous and righteousness is a bit of a damaged term today. I mean, we hardly ever use the word righteous except in the compound phrase self-righteous. I mean, when else do you hear it? It's, It's got negative connotations. But righteousness is just shorthand for what is right. Right? It's interchangeable with justice a word in English people tend to like today. It just means the right thing, the good. But the challenge of this particular beatitude is, are we hungry for it? Are we hungry for it? See, when you're hungry, you're like really hungry, you'll do almost anything to just get a bite, right? That's not just me, is it? And when you're thirsty... You'll, you'll like drink anything. Just, oh, I need to quench my thirst. And, and, and Jesus is saying, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the challenge. Are you hungry for this? Are you thirsty for this? Now, I can't get up here and command you. Because like, it's a desire, right? I can't say, be thirsty. 
And all of a sudden you go, ooh, I feel like a drink. No. But I want to suggest if, if you're sitting there this morning and you're not quite sure you're hungry for this righteousness, this justice, it's because maybe you're not thinking about righteousness the right way. Maybe you're thinking of it as a burden, like a moral burden placed on you. I'm not hungry for that. But if you think of righteousness as the manufacturer's instructions, the genius of the creator, the very thing you have been made for, then you will hunger. You'll say, Lord, I want this. And he will fill you. Verse 7 adds more content to this way of righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Here's a well-kept secret. Throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, human mercy is the equivalent of what we today call charity. It actually means to be to show pity to uh, the vulnerable and the poor. All the way through the Bible. That's what merciful means. In fact, the next time we hear this word, it's a direct reference to charity. Here's the next time we hear it. Um, it's still in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes on to say, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. And you might look at that and go, well, I don't see the word mercy. But it's exactly the same word. Poies eliemesune. Do mercy. And throughout the Bible, whenever you see the expression give to the needy, it is virtually always poies eliemesune. Do mercy. So the merciful back here, just one chapter earlier, are the Eliamenes, those who do mercy. It refers to those who care for the needy. How are you doing with that? And Jesus says, those who are merciful in that way will receive God's mercy. Now you might look at that and go, hang on, that doesn't sound right. As in, if I practice mercy to others, I'll earn God's mercy? No. I know you're well enough taught in this church. <laughs> no, to know that. no way. It's just that showing mercy to others is the great sign, the great fruit, the great proof that you have been touched by the mercy of God. If you have experienced the mercy of God, you will show mercy to others. And all of this, the meekness, the righteousness, the mercy, must be sincere, the very next beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In English, we associate the word pure like with the opposite of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, don't we? Like if you say someone's pure, we're thinking they don't get up to the naughty things. Right? Isn't that, that's, that's how people use the word, oh, they're so pure. But that's not what this means. Pure in heart just means really genuine, utterly sincere. John Stott, the great British theologian and commentator on the Sermon on the Mount, writes, I think, really well about this. The pure in heart are the utterly sincere. Their whole life, public and private, is transparent before God and men. Their very heart, including their thoughts and motives, is pure, unmixed with anything devious, ulterior or base. Hypocrisy and deceit are abhorrent to them. There's something really important to say. God doesn't expect sinlessness from us frail creatures. But he does expect sincerity. Duplicity and hypocrisy are like stains on my glasses. They're like cataracts in my eyes, meaning I can't see God. But Jesus says the sincere, 
the pure of heart. People who know that they're sinful and yet they long to follow the way of God. They will see God. The last two Beatitudes form a really neat pair. We are to work for peace and put up with persecution. Verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Now you gotta hear this like Jesus' first audience will have heard it because Jesus is almost certainly directing this at those who were agitating for violent uprising against the Romans. So when he says the peacemakers are the true children of God, there are a lot of people in the audience going, what? Surely it's those who will rise up against the Romans. Mm -mm. The true children of God seek peace in a divided society. Now, I might get into trouble with this, but I really hope I'm not speaking out of turn because I know I've only been in your country seven weeks. But I have a real problem. I can't for the life of me work out which news channel to watch. <laughs> like, I switch on and there's this channel, I don't know if you've heard of it, it, it I think it's called CNN, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I watch that and I hear about this, some half of America is evil and terrible and corrupt. And I go, well, that doesn't sound good. So I switch over to this other channel uh, called Foxy or something like that, right? And apparently there's another whole half of the country that is also evil and terrible. The vitriol is amazing. So uh, frankly, if you know a TV channel I can watch without thinking you're all hopeless, please let me know. ESPN. 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 <laughs> Especially on a Sunday. Huh. But actually, I mean, you know, I, I'm open for tips. Uh, Jeff's given me a tip, local news five or something, is that right? Chicago news, right? Um, actually, he said, just watch the BBC. <laughs> so unpatriotic. <laughs> anyway, here's my point. I see a massive opportunity for American Christians here to shun the vitriol to shun the division and tribalism that seems to be everywhere in public and pursue peace, to reach out, to embrace. Because I'm pretty sure Jesus said that's what the children of God do. They also put up with persecution Sorry about this. I didn't make this up. This is Jesus. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We must never harm for the cause of Christ, but we ought to be willing to put up with harm for the cause of Christ. And notice it's persecution for righteousness, not for being a jerk, which is very easy to do as a Christian. When I was first a Christian as a 16, 17 year old from a completely non-churched household in Australia, I used to pray and read my Bible a lot. And, and, and it often coincided with Saturday morning when I was meant to do jobs around the house. I was very spiritual, Saturday mornings. <laughs> And I remember one time, it was, it was my, my turn to rake the leaves out the front. And I heard my mum yell out to me, John, rake the leaves, Saturday morning. And I prayed and read my Bible. I was literally on my knees next to my bed. And I yelled out, I'm doing something really important. She yelled out again, I'm busy. She burst into my bedroom, sees me there on my knees, praying and reading the Bible. And she was not happy. Okay, I won't give you the actual words. 
She stormed out of the room, slammed the door, and I honestly remember thinking to myself, it's just like Jesus said, I'm being persecuted. <laughs> no, no, I was not being persecuted. <laughs> Friends, if we're going to be criticized by the world, please, let's make it for the way of justice, righteousness. Not for being obnoxious, arrogant, judgmental, hypocritical. Well, that's our attitude. Admitting injustice in our own hearts, mourning the injustice of the world. That's our action. Humble, generous, sincere, peace-loving, enduring insult. Let me close with impact. The impact of this way on the wider world. Um, two brief thoughts, and, and then I'm done. The first thing Jesus says about the impact this is going to have is that you're not always going to win the respect of everyone. Even if you're not obnoxious and arrogant, even if you are pursuing the way of righteousness, look what he says. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know what? As I was preparing this message, I also happened for another reason to be um, searching online for an old media article in Australia that mentioned my public work in Australia favourably. That's narcissistic, isn't it? I was looking for an article about me. But as I was Googling for that, another media article from Australia popped up that castigated me as a lightweight bigot. I don't know how I'd missed that when that article came out, but I'm kind of glad I did miss it. Because when I read it and discovered I'm a lightweight bigot, I'd been reflecting on the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And you know what? It was weird. I didn't feel outraged. I didn't feel like sending the journalist a defensive reply. No, I felt peace. Because I remembered these words that sometimes even our best efforts to live for Jesus backfire. And, and we just got to put up with that. In fact, more than that, we've got to be cheerful. Rejoice, Jesus says. And some of you may be experiencing this right now. You're being mistreated as a Christian, not because you're a jerk, not because you're arrogant, but, but genuinely you've tried to live for Christ and it's not working. There's friends and neighbours, people at university or whatever are castigating you. Well, in those moments, we need to recall the ancient Christian art of losing really well. Jesus was the master, wasn't he? Even on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That said, the last thing Jesus says is that despite the occasional loss we will experience, the way of righteousness, the way of justice can win the world. He gives two metaphors, salt and light. You know the passage. I don't really know what the first one means. I know that's terrible. I'm meant to be a professor at Wheaton College and all that, right? But I don't. I do know what salt was used for in the ancient world. I can tell you that. It was a seasoner in food. People loved it. It preserved meat and fish. And it was literally used as a kind of soap. People rubbed it on their skin to, to purify uh, themselves. But I, I don't know what... Jesus means, therefore, that you're the salt of the earth. Um, does he mean that you're like the spice of the world? Eh, I don't know. What about you preserve the world from going rotten? Mm. You're the cleanser? I don't know. So I'd prefer to just say it's something really good. <laughs> Do you still use the expression salt of the earth when, to describe someone? No, that's just a weird British Australian thing. You do, because you're weird 
Salt of the earth. Like, it's, it comes from this passage. You describe someone as the salt of the earth. It just means really good stuff. So I, I think that's what Jesus is saying, really good stuff. Okay, I do know what the light metaphor means because this is really obvious. You are the light of the world. And this you here, by the way, is a plural you. You know, in English, we killed this, the distinction between singular and plural you. You know, every other language in the world has preserved a singular you and a plural you. But we, I don't know, we got rid of it or something. So it's hard for us to see that what Jesus is saying is, y'all. <laughs> Did I do that right? <laughs> I'm sure it's not as good as his good day, mate. But anyway. Y'all are the singular light. Now, I think that's interesting. You all are the light. That is the community of Christians living out the way of God, lights up the world. And the thing is, this metaphor of a light for the world comes straight from the book of Isaiah. Um, Here's Isaiah 49.6. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Or Isaiah 51, listen to me, my people, instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way and my arm will bring justice to the nations. Think about this. According to Isaiah, centuries before Jesus, one day God will light up the world with his instruction his justice, his righteousness, and his salvation. Now, Jesus takes that famous idea and he says, y'all are the light of the world. You lot. And he says, it's through your deeds. He stresses it. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And glorify your Father in heaven. Now this expression, glorify your Father, is a biblical way of saying what we today might call conversion. If someone gives glory to God, it means they're converted to God's way. Jesus is saying, and it's remarkable when you ponder it, the good deeds of his people will shine the light of salvation to the world. And in context, these good deeds must be the good deeds of meekness, peacemaking, putting up with persecution, and so on. When we live out the instruction of Jesus, we give people a visual of the gospel. As we pursue love, justice, mercy. People see the love and justice and mercy of God. Well, that's how it's meant to work. Let me share with you some interesting Australian research, and then I'm done. A really big social survey company asked Australians what they thought of Christians. (laughs) It was like the church report card. And I'm sad to say they created this list, this top 10, and in the top 10 were hypocritical. 17% of people think Christians are hypocritical. Opinionated, old-fashioned, judgmental, traditional. Jesus didn't hope for that. But I am happy to say that the top five were faithful, honest, kind, loving, caring. Huh. That almost sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the interesting thing is the researchers in their reports with this survey said, I know it looks really weird, like the bottom five are all bad and the top five are good. And you might think there's this one portion of Australia that thinks Christians are idiots and another portion that thinks they're pretty good. But he, he, the researcher, the key, key researcher said, no, actually these are the same people. In the survey, they, they, they're literally trying to think of Christians and they go, oh, hypocritical. 
judgmental. Oh, and then there's my Auntie Mary, loving, (laughs) caring, right? The same people are thinking mixed things about Christians. And my point is this. I've been coming to America long enough to have a hunch that it's the same in non-Christian America. They have two Christianities in their head at the same time. They've got one perception of Christians as hypocritical and judgmental and another perception just sitting there right alongside it as the, as, as the way they know Christians are meant to live, caring, loving. And how we live as a collective, y'all, and as individuals can activate one or other perception amongst our neighbours who don't believe. Now, I don't know if that's precisely true of the people of Geneva and around. Do they have a mixed perception of Christianity? Maybe. All I know is that if we are going to shine the light of salvation, it cannot be because we are projecting this. But only this. Or to put it as Jesus puts it, we will be the light of the world when we admit our own poverty of soul, grieve instead of condemn the sin of the world, pursue meekness instead of wrath, when we hunger for righteousness, merciful to those in need, utterly sincere, even despite our failings, working for peace in a divided world and put up with insult, with joy. That is the way of justice. That is the way of righteousness. And it is how we promote the instruction, justice, righteousness, and salvation of God to our world. So Lord, will you please enable us by your spirit to do what can't be done on our own. To live the way of justice and bless our unbelieving world. For we ask it in the name of the Lord of justice himself, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.